Like, what is that business? Where, where, where are you? What do you do? Like, this is a great way for you to, um, to like network with each other, but then also for me to use your businesses as examples, because we're going to be talking about websites tonight. And as like I said, if you guys know me, you know, that I really love, um, like I love show and tell. I don't just want to uh, show. I just, I want to also like show you guys what to do and how to do it and all that jazz. And so the best way for me to do that is if I have that chat and I can see who you are and like use your businesses as examples. See, I knew Carlos. I knew that was you. Uh, so yeah, in the chat, tell me who you are, where you're from. There's a bunch of y'all 10 KSB people in there. So if you want to tell me, tell each other <laughs> that, that would be great too, because there's so many, it's great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Everyone in, like I said, go ahead, use the chat. Tell me about yourself. Uh, Lachelle, it's good to see you. Uh, so yeah, put that information in there and we're going to jump right in. So this workshop is all about making your, your small business, but your website in general, more accessible. Um, and by making our small business website more accessible, we're going to just make ourselves more accessible in general. And we're also going to be making ourselves really SEO friendly. Uh, and if you know what search engine optimization is, that's what SEO is. That's what I was talking about just a second ago. If you can make yourself and your website more accessible, then you're also going to make yourself easier to find in search and then also easier for a lot of um, a lot of the the e-readers and things like that to be able to read your website for someone who is using assistive technology. I won't name any of that assistive technology, but you guys are all familiar with it. And if I said the name of one of them right now, the one that starts with an A and ends with an A, you would likely have that device go off in your house. Or if I say you know, hey, and then the sponsor of this workshop, <laughs> and then your device would go off. Or if I say that name that starts with an S and ends with an I, your phone might go off. So all of those are actually reading your website. They are reading the internet. And what we want to do is make sure that our websites are accessible so that if someone is using one of those female names um, to get your, I'll, I'll type them in the chat because I can't say them. I like, I tell you, if I say it out loud, uh, you guys know it's gonna, you're gonna be like, uh, oh yeah, that's right. That's what will happen. So um, if you can share that with everyone, Anita, that's what I'm talking about. Those, those are the ones, if I say them, you guys, your phones are going to go off. But that's part of what we're optimizing for is for those devices to be able to read and hear for your um Amazon device for your iPhone and for your, you know, Apple for your non iPhones for me, Android to be able to understand what your website said. Okay. So hi, I'm Lindsay. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I am the Ohio Grow with Google Digital Coach. And I'm also the CEO and founder of a business called Predictable Results Marketing. Um, what I do as a digital coach is to help you and you know anyone who is a part of the Ohio or greater Ohio, because there's people in here from Minnesota, uh, wherever you're coming in from, I'm here to help you to like, grow your skills, like to actually become better at skills and things like that so that you can grow your business. Okay. So that's it. And if you are watching on YouTube, I know there's a couple of people watching on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, you can feel free to use the chat on YouTube as well. Cause I'm actually watching that chat as well over on the other screen. So go ahead, tell me um, about yourself in the chat there. Cause I definitely want to know. So what is the agenda for today? We are going to go over a few things. What is accessibility? how to have an accessible design, how to make your email, your physical, and you know, just in general to be more inclusive. We're gonna talk about all of those topics and we're gonna probably look at a few of your websites in the process. So if you can, if you can put your website in the chat, I would love that because I'm going to try to, I'm going to use your websites as examples of how to like think about accessibility and your search engine optimization at the same time. Okay. So baseline, what is accessibility? Accessibility is the idea of making sure that people who have disabilities can actually perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with your product services and tools. So when I say that, I mean that no matter what their disability is, we want to make sure that they are able to interact with our business. 
often when we think about accessibility, we think about physical accessibility or physical disability, right? So people who have clear and obvious disabilities that are clear to us, um, people who are in wheelchairs, people who use canes, people who are um, clearly blind, like we can see that they cannot see, they are profoundly blind, or people who are profoundly deaf where we can see that they can't hear. Like we think of those as disabilities, but there are a variety of disabilities out there that are less visible and are just as needed for accessible technology, right? So what we are using is the technologies that we have accessible to us right now, and we're going to figure out how to take those things and make our websites and our businesses more accessible using that stuff, okay? So yes, Dana, you got the right idea. Everybody else, do what Dana's doing. Put your website in the chat so that I can see a link to your website and be able to use you as an example. So accessibility impacts over 1 billion people. 1 billion people around the world are living with some form of disability. That's 15% of the world's population, one in four adults in the U.S. with over $6 trillion of spending power. I like to add my own personal statistic to this, which is that 100% of people will experience some form of temporary disability in their lifetime. So that is not to say that you will have a permanent disability, but everyone will experience some form of temporary disability. So for women, a very common temporary disability is pregnancy. Um, I know that you guys are like, pregnancy is not a disability, but if you've ever seen a pregnant woman try to put on shoes, you'll know what I mean by that. Uh, so it is that you are temporarily unable to do the things that you were able to do. And then even afterwards, oh my goodness, when you're carting this kid around and this enormous contraption that cannot get through doors or upstairs or downstairs or any of those things, those are assistive devices to actually help you, except for that they themselves are kind of a barrier sometimes, depending on how well accessible the areas are that you're trying to access. And so temporary disability is one of those things that a lot of people experience. We break legs, we break arms, we have a retina detached. There's all sorts of reasons why we are temporarily disabled. And what's great is that if we are actually making our websites and our businesses more accessible, we can make ourselves accessible for people all the time, regardless of whether they are permanently permanently disabled, newly disabled, or temporarily disabled, they will be able to use our devices, okay, or our websites. So what we're doing, expanding our market. Again, like I said, this is, you might think of this as like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to be smart about accessibility for disabled people. But the reality is I want you to get all the customers that you possibly can. And that includes customers who you maybe haven't been able to reach before because they didn't have the proper assistance for your website. And we also are going to lessen that legal risk a little bit, because despite the fact that you know, not everyone is going to have a problem with the fact that your website is not accessible. I can tell you this is not a scare tactic. Don't read it that way at all. But I personally know several people who have been sued over their website not being accessible. And so you do want to make sure that your website has some sort of disability or accessibility statement. That lets people know that if for some reason they are unable to use your website in its current format, that you will provide them with an accessible version in a timely manner if they contact you and then give them a way to contact you. So this is a way, to, again, to protect yourself kind of against the idea that people might want to come after you because your website is not accessible. And then on top of that, well, just make your website more accessible will help you to become less of a legal risk in and of itself, right? So what is this concept called? It is called universal design. It's the idea of designing for everyone and not just designing for a few people, okay? So what are the tenets of universal design? There are a few very specific things. Image descriptions, alt text, color and contrast, design techniques, formatting your text properly, making sure that your text links are descriptive, and then using captions and transcripts. These are things that are both accessible and extremely useful if you have, uh, if you're trying to optimize your website for search. Because one of the things that accessibility devices and search engine optimization have in common is words. As I like to say, Google doesn't do anything but read. It cannot see, it only reads. And so when you add in image descriptions, alt text, when you add in text formatting and text links and video captions, what that is doing is giving Google more words to understand your website. 
That is a very useful tool, adding in more words for Google to understand your website. So if you look at this image that you see here, if you can put in the chat, what is this an image of? What would you describe this image as? What is this an image of? Go ahead, put it in the chat. What do you see here? Oh, I love it, Mary. Mary's like, I write for a living. You're gonna enjoy this workshop. So what do y'all see in this image? I can feel some of you already making it too complicated. <laughs> What do we see in this image? Okay, we got a cup of coffee, a filled cup with a spoon on the side, a cup of a uh, cup of coffee on a saucer with a spoon. What else? Uh, my cup, my morning cup of coffee, coffee shop coffee, just regular coffee, coffee, uh, black coffee on a saucer with a spoon. Okay, so y'all got all the varieties of coffee. I'm surprised Carlos didn't say tea. Uh, Carlos, this is clearly to me, this is a cup of Earl Grey. Uh, <laughs> that is oversteeped. <laughs> it's absolutely, yes, a cup of black tea. Thank you very much, Carlos. That's exactly what I would put if I was on Carlos. Carlos sells tea for those of y'all who didn't catch that in the chat. So yes, description is basically, it is a cup of coffee. Now, if this was Carlos, I would say it's a cup of tea, but mostly because that's what Carlos sells. When you are creating your alt text or your alternate descriptions for your website, you do not have to make it complicated. You can make it extremely simple. So some of you went all in on describing it, but others of you made it really simple. It's a cup of coffee. I think Anita has seen this workshop. She's like, it's a cup of coffee. <laughs> but what we wanna do is make sure that we are being descriptive, but also that we're using information that is useful, right? So we're descriptive and useful. So let me go to, let me go to the T-Lab website real quick. So since we had um, Carlos here, I'm going to paste this website into the uh, into the bar here. And the first thing we see after we see that little bar at the top, we see an image and it says today's tea, house made 725 eggnog, caffeine free rubus blend with white chocolate cinnamon and nutmeg. That sounds amazing. Now, if we hover over this image, this image is actually a link. So if I tap on this image, it's going to be a link. I can tell that it's a link because my little thing turns into a hand, my cursor turns into a hand, and I can actually see the image text down at the bottom. But if I right click on this image and I see if I can do a little bit of an inspection, I want to see if this image has a name. So I am going to actually, I'm going to do something that'll make it really easy for me to see. And I save the image as. As soon as I click on save image as, if you guys can see this, I think you can. It says here eggnog, and then it's got a number 29940, whatever. That is the name of that image. So over here on our wet on our little presentation, we have an image. There you go. You guys can see it. It says eggnog. Now, for Carlos's sake, even though the name of that image is eggnog. Since his website is actually selling tea, he might want to change the description, the alt text on that image, literally the name of the image, to something along the lines of eggnog tea, because that's literally what it is. So let's go back to it. We got house tea, um, 725, number 725, eggnog. Why? Because the term eggnog on a tea website doesn't mean the same thing to people, right? It doesn't mean tea. They might be thinking of something else. And so what we definitely want to do is signal to people that this is still a tea product by using the word tea, okay? I love that you have any image name at all, but we want to make sure that that description is written for the purposes of SEO. So it's not just eggnog, but that we get that search engine optimization value, right? The value of making sure that people know that we're on a tea website and that I'm not selling eggnog in general, I am selling a tea blend that gives you the taste of and the feeling of eggnog, okay? Now, in addition to that, these image texts, this alt text is gonna help people who are blind because it's going to read it to them and it's going to say 
eggnog, tea, right? It's going to say those words, but then it also helps people who are sighted who maybe just don't understand what they're looking at. And so having that description there is always really great. So you can do both. You can have an alt text and a description, and both of those things are going to be read by your search engine. So by Google, by Bing, by Yahoo, any other search engine that's out there is going to read both of those pieces of text, and they're going to use that information to know more about your website and specifically to know more about the image that's on the website. Now, in addition to making sure your images have some sort of alternate text, that's what that means, alt text, you're going to write a short description of the image and maybe write a caption. A caption is a longer description that has some key information. So we see a little chart over here on the side. This chart could have alt text, alternative text, but then in addition, it has a caption that has a longer description of what is on that image. This is really good, again, for something that's a little bit more complicated. The image is of something a little bit complicated, and we want to make sure that people understand what that image is. So if I, I don't know, Flechelle, did you put yours in here? I was going to go to, oh, I will go to Dana's website. So I'm going to go to Dana's website. I was going to go to Lachelle's because I know her business, but I like seeing new people's websites too, right? So I'm going to go to Dana's. I already told y'all, if you put your name, your, your business in the chat, I'm going to, I'm going, I'm all for it. So what I love here is that immediately we have fallen Wisconsin State Trooper Memorial. Ah, Dana, you are doing it right, right off the bat. Dana has the text at the bottom. That is the caption for that image. La Crosse Memorial's Handcroft Waterfall Monument. Love it, right? So she has that longer description. That is literally a caption. Now, what we want to make sure is that in addition to the caption, that she also has alt text because a caption and alt text are not the same thing. They are two different things. So what we have here is Memorial Jet Black Buck Etching. I love it. So again, Dana doing it right. The name of the image, example of Nature Memorials, Dana, you are doing all of the things. So Dana has the caption, the alt text, and the image name are all associated with the literal thing that's in the image. She is doing all of those things off the top, right at that very first image on the website. So when we're looking at our websites and we're trying to make sure that they are accessible, we want to do what Dana did, which is to say every part of the image that is showing here is got enough information for an e-reader, whether that is the woman whose name starts with an S, the one who starts with an A, the one that's promoted by the people hosting this workshop, or any other reader at all, any of them would be able to read any of these images. That is a beautiful thing. Absolutely beautiful. Now, the one thing that I would say Dana could do a little bit better, and this is something that most of us don't even think about, but we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but I'm going to talk about it right now since I'm on Dana's website, is the text on this website could be a little bit bigger, especially here in the caption. The captions are very small. And so I almost missed it. I didn't, but I almost did. And that's because the captions were pretty small. So you want to make sure that your captions are big enough for people to read them at a glance, um, knowing that the majority of people who are reading your website are going to be using our number one assistive device, glasses. And so those of us who use glasses are quite familiar with the idea that we can't see. So if you are <laughs> if you are not putting enough um, the text big enough on a website, a lot of people who are wearing glasses might not be able to see. So make sure your, your uh, text is a little bit bigger. We When we were in school back in the old days, we learned to write in 12 point font. That 12 point times New Roman did us wrong because 12 point font is actually way too small for the majority of people who are reading. So if your website currently has 12 point font as a standard, you might want to up that to 14, maybe even 16. And I know it might feel cartoonish to make your website images or your web website text that big, except for that that's the standard for most people. Like most people can't see anything smaller than that easily. 
And especially for something like a memorial website or for a T website, the majority of your clientele is over the age of 25. And so you don't have to, you need to worry about like, they, can, they can't see 25 year olds and up. We were, all of us are wearing some sort of assistive device. By the time someone's 25, they've given up on the idea that glasses make them look bad. They're wearing their glasses. They're, they're using their assistive devices. So make sure that you make your text big enough for people to see. Now, in addition to that, we want to be thinking about color and contrast. Now, this does not help you with SEO at all, but it does make your website significantly more friendly to 50% of the population. So men, 50% of our population is made up of men or people who are uh, uh, born gendered male. That's the proper, proper way to say that, born gendered male or gender identified male at birth. Either of those things, those people have an extremely high number of them who are colorblind. Colorblindness in men is like way more common than we realize. Um, it is, I don't know, I think it's like a third of men are colorblind, something like that. It's really high. And so as a function of that, and that colorblindness is a spectrum. Colorblindness is not one like you are not either colorblind or not. Um, colorblindness is actually a spectrum of a spectrum disorder, meaning that people fall on that range of seeing colors differently. As a function, we want to make sure that we are using very high contrast. So that means if you have, like Dana's website, Dana's got a beautiful website here, but she does have some color on color. She's got some things where like this white text is on a light gray background and it looks a little grayish. She might want to darken the contrast on that white to gray background to make the background a little bit darker so that the white text stands out a little bit more, right? So we want to make sure that even in that context of that white text on a gray background, we want to make sure that it stands out more for people who can't see color. Because as much as like, especially women, those of us who are who don't have any problems differentiating color, we're out here going, why can't they see that? And it's simply because their eyes don't see color the way that ours do. So making sure that our contrast is great. Now, line thickness, patterns, um, textures, labels, all of these things matter when we're looking at our websites. If you are designing a website or when you have your website that has already been designed, you want to think about brightness. Um, how bright is the website? How well does the contrast show up? How thick are the lines? If you have lines on your website where the line is meant to distinguish one thing from another, how thick is that line so that people can actually see it, right? We want to make sure that if we're using patterns, that we use patterns that have a lot of differentiation in the hue so that people can tell that there's a pattern there. Um, I Again, I'll use Dana's example, Dana's website as an example. She has a uh, three-point marker here. Now, she on this image, I'm going to hold it down so that it doesn't go anywhere, but I did and then I stopped. So on this image, we have three different um, nature-themed memorials. On that three different memorials, the image, the line between them is very, very minimal. Like you can barely see the difference between them. And if someone had a very difficult time distinguishing different colors, they might not be easily able to tell the difference between one image that those are not the same image, right? This is not a, something for Dana to be worried about. This Her website's great. She doesn't have to worry about that. But if she wanted to make it a little bit more friendly on design, she might want to make that line between those three things a little bit more distinct so that anyone, anyone would be able to see the difference between those three images clearly. That's really the idea. How do we make sure that people can see the difference between things clearly? Um, I love the example of the grayscale here. We might be thinking, you might be thinking, oh, wow, that grayscale, everything looks the same, except for in grayscale, color has a pattern. It's kind of crazy, but it has a pattern. And then if you see here on this lines and dashes, if you have a chart that currently only has different colors, you might consider making a dotted dash and solid line so that people who can't see color differences can see the difference between the dots, the dashes, and the lines. So you're just adding that variation that makes it a little bit easier for someone to tell the difference between those things 
especially if they can't see color. So that's, it's so odd sometimes to think about a, you know, a, a disability that you don't have, but if it, you consider colorblindness to be a disability, which I don't even think that's considered in that, those numbers that we were talking about, I think that for the most part, something like colorblindness is not considered to be a disability, but it absolutely changes how people see websites. And so you want to make sure that your website, if you do have lines, if you do have dashes, if you do have things like that, that you're being as clear about them as possible by using dashes, dots, solid lines to differentiate things instead of just using color, okay? Now, in addition to that, Using text that is different sizes to indicate different importance level is extremely useful. Now, part of it is because your assistive technology can only understand the text. Like it doesn't know anything other than big text is the first thing on the page. And second biggest text is the second thing on the page. Third biggest text is the third thing. Like it literally hierarchies what it says out loud based on the header, the header number, whether it's an H1, H2, all that, it is reading that and determining which things are most important. Now with our websites, we tend to not do that, right? We tend to make the thing that we think is most important the biggest thing and not necessarily the thing that is most important. So on the uh, T-Lab website, we have here the perfect addition to any tea gift. That is the first H1 on this page, is on the slider. That doesn't tell us a lot about this website. It is the first thing we see, but it doesn't tell us a lot about the website. Now, what you want to think is that how can I make the first thing that's on my website be the most important thing? Now, it's not bad, Carlos, this is not a bad thing, but it's not the best way to approach it, right? It's not gonna be the most useful thing to put on the website. So if we look over at Dana's website, Dana has this here, which is the first, because any image that's, all of her images are beautiful, but the other thing that Dana does not have is any text in above this image that's readable by a, a website. Like it's not readable by SEO. So what her first text on her website is, is when life turns, life twins to memories twin to us. Now I know this says turns, but I did that on purpose because boy, oh boy, does it not look like turns? It looks like twins. This font is making this difficult to read. It's beautiful, but it's difficult to read. So when life turns to memories, turn to us. Great tagline. But what you really want here, Dana, is text that tells people lacrosse memorials. And then maybe when life turns to memories, turns to us, turn to us. Now that way, what's the first thing? And it could even be memorials for when life turns to memories, something like that, right? So you're telling the internet and anyone who is using an assistive device what exactly you do, especially because this here is not your, this is an image, right? So it says lacrosse memorials, which is great. You got alt text on it, but it is an image. So it's not the first H tag. It's not, remember we have the hierarchy. It's not the title of the page. The title of this page, according to the internet is when life turns to memories, turn to us. And we want to make sure that the title of our page to the internet is actually the title that we want people to hear if they had an assistive device, right? I love that. And okay, so Dana agrees with me. She thinks it looks like twins too. <laughs> I'm like, I know it doesn't say twins, but that's what my eyes see. <laughs> so with uh, Lachelle's website, so we can go to another website to see how, how it's done a little differently. So with Lachelle's website, we have the first thing, welcome to Give Me a Hand Academy. That is the first header tag on the website. Now, why is this important? Now, I've seen this website before. But the last time I saw the website, it actually didn't look like this. Lachelle has made some changes to this website since the last time I saw it. And what's lovely about this is that the first thing on the website that we see and that the internet sees is the name of the business. Give me a hand academy. This is the Ohio Nail School, right? So the only thing I would make different here is because I know it's the Ohio Nail School. I know the website is ohionailschool.com is that I would put in here like where gems shine. That, I love that tagline. But I would say something like Ohio's first nail school 
and then where gems shine <laughs> because her claim to fame is that she's Ohio's first nails only so like school academy. It's a beautiful claim to fame and she should put it up there so that people can see it in that very first thing. But when a reader is reading her website, it is going to read, give me a hand first. It is going to know that that's what the website is about. And it's going to see here um, where gems shine, turn your love for nails into a salon empire. Love it. It's very descriptive, very much so on brand, right? So after we get to the point where we are making the text stand out, we're putting the right text in the right spot to make it stand out. The next thing we're going to do is make sure that we are using extremely descriptive links. So this is something that Google loves. This is great for your SEO and it's really, really, really good for search optimization. So something like visit this link for free training. The words, visit this link. If I was reading this as an e-reader, right? If I'm an e-reader be reading this, if I'm an auditory reader, one of those you know, devices from Amazon or your Apple or your Google phone, if I'm one of those and it, it reads out loud, visit this link, what does that tell you? It tells you nothing and because there's nothing descriptive about that. So visit the Grow With Google homepage for free training. That is descriptive so that if someone is having the website read to them because they're cooking or because they're doing something else, it actually is saying words that they can hear and understand instead of just saying, visit this link. And now I have to stop everything and go over to the device to see what link it is, which mind you, you're not going to do. No one else is going to do that either. We're just never going to click on that link. We're never going to go to that website because we don't know what that link is. We don't know what the website is. So we wanna make sure that we are using very good descriptive text. Now, why is this useful for search engine optimization? Two things, Google loves links. They love links on your website that either go to other pages on your website or that go to pages outside of your website. They love internal navigation and when you are driving traffic to other people. Either way, Google loves it. It adds authority to your website. So if I'm going to go back to Carlos's website, he has available in two sizes. And then this link goes to the T-Lab tea egg made of stainless steel uh, featuring the T-Lab logo for a logo charm available in two sizes. This little button here is the link. This button needs to say something like T-Lab tea egg available in two sizes. And it could just say tea egg available in two sizes. And then that way it's more descriptive because alone that button doesn't say anything. That's one of the biggest mistakes that we make is that our buttons don't actually say what it is that we're going to do when someone clicks on it. So view our gallery. Here Dana is being awesome again. View our gallery is great because it's literally what the button is going to take you to. It is going to take you to a gallery so that you can look at it. <laughs> like, the only thing I would say differently to do, Dana, is view our gallery is still super generic, right? Like maybe you can say view our gallery of memorials. And if it is a mem like memorials that you've done in the past, and you could say something like view our client memorials. There we go. So instead of view our gallery, view our client memorials, view recent memorials, view our past memorials. That way it's like, it's because view our gallery is still very boring and plain when you can add more words to be more descriptive because the word gallery just means group of images versus if you have that group of images, you know that group of images is of a bunch of memorials, you can make it more descriptive, right? So just making things a little bit more descriptive. View our classes. That is a really good call to action. It tells me exactly what's going to happen when I go on this button. I'm going to view the classes, right? So want to make sure that whatever the buttons are, whatever the things are, are very, very descriptive. Now, while we are on this area, we have here a bunch of logos that are for uh, Lachelle's authority. She has been featured in USA Today, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Nails Magazine, Column Post, the Cleveland, uh, Cranes Cleveland. And what this little image here, this is one image, and the name of this image is Logos. And what we should make sure the name of this image is, is as seen in USA Today, 
Plain Dealer, Nails Magazine, Column Posts, and Cleveland uh, Cranes Cleveland Business. That is what the name of that image should be because it's descriptive. The description of it is what it is. Otherwise, the word logos, if someone was reading that, wouldn't mean anything. So Lachelle, you're doing a bunch of things right. We got to change up some of those image tags so that the alt text on those images is more descriptive of what is actually in there. Now, we've been talking a ton about images. Let's talk about videos for a second. One of the easiest things that we can do is to create image captions. Image captions and transcripts are your absolute best friend when it comes to your website. So if you have, if you're a lacrosse lamore, if you're Dana, and you've got a website that has a ton of images, then Dana's job is to go through and make sure every image in here has alt text. Oh my goodness, I'm loving it, Dana, I'm in love. I don't love how small these images are, but I do love the fact that they all have, look at that, they all have captions, they all have text. I can hover over any of them and it tells me exactly what it is. It's great. But Dana, you could take all of these images and turn them into a lovely product video with a voiceover describing your services. Now, when I say a voiceover, y'all, they have this new technology called AI, where you can have <laughs> an AI voice read your text for you. So if you don't, if Dana, you're like, I don't want to do no video like that, you can go to Canva. Canva, y'all, Canva is my favorite tool ever. Um, Canva actually has AI voices now that will read your text on the screen for you. So it will auto-generate captions and then read those captions out loud. You can go to your favorite um, AI copywriter and have them write the script for you. It's very easy. Um, there's a bunch of different technologies to do this. So again, if you're Dana and you have a bunch of images, you can take some of those images, write a really nice script for it, turn it into a video, and then make sure that that video has automated captions and that you take the transcript for that video and that you put it on the web page with the video. So in addition to the video itself having the captions, you then have the transcript for the video on that page. These are very easy things to do nowadays. One of my favorite um, technologies for doing this right now is a software called Pictory. It's just Pictory AI. And what Pictory allows you to do is to create really, really robust videos from images. So if you have a bunch of images, you can have the images, you can drop in your transcript of like your script of what you want it to read. It will read the AI and it will put the captions on the, the like images for you. And so it does all those things in one step. And it's also, it's very inexpensive. It's like less than 50 bucks a month and there's no contract. So you can just buy it for the one month to do it that way. And yes, Lachelle, you can do it on Canva. If you are a Canva pro already, you can do it on Canva for the same amount that you're paying for Canva normal, which is like 13 bucks a month. Very, very inexpensive. You do not have to work hard for this stuff, but doing it will make your website even better. Okay. Automated captions are your friend. So there are several ways to do automated captions. YouTube actually does an automated caption feature. So if you put your video, so I mentioned just now you could get a video created in Pictory or Canva. If you then upload that video onto YouTube and store it there, it'll automatically close caption the video for you as well. And it has auto translate. And now with AI auto translate, auto translate is actually really good. So if you want your videos to be accessible to people in other languages, you can actually use auto caption for that, auto translate for various languages. It's amazing what's out there. And both of those things, mind you, so if you if if Dana uses my tip about using doing the memorials into a video, first of all, that's going to give her another page on her website that can help her describe what she does better. But then also all of those words that are in the script that is in that auto, you know, AI voice video, all of those words in the captions on YouTube are now ways for people to find her on YouTube via search. And all of those words that are now on her website are, sorry, all of those words that are now on her website are ways for people to actually find her using Google search. So, oh man, these things are so useful to you. Like, don't just think, oh, well, I don't have any video, so I don't need to pay attention to this part. Think, how can I take what I already have and turn it into video? And if I already have some video that I'm not using, how can I then take the caption and the transcript from that video and put it on my website to get more search 
potentially from those videos, okay? In addition to YouTube, you also have like a bunch of other software like Vimeo. Um, Vimeo is another uh, video storage software that uses a automatic captioning for you. Um, ones that do it on social media, uh, Instagram can do automatic captions. TikTok can do automatic captions. And if you want a video editor that's on your phone that you can use to do automatic captions, I just had a student of mine who created a beautiful video and he was like, I only need captions. He didn't need anything else but captions. He didn't want to mess the video up or do anything to it. He had the editing. He was editing it inside of Canva and Canva does not do auto captions. And so he actually used CapCut, which generated automatic captions on the video that he had already created. So he created this beautiful video in Canva that he loved and he didn't want to use any other software to do the captions. So he just dropped it into CapCut, got the captions and went from there. And so there's all sorts of fun ways to get captions on content that you already have. So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, cap content that you are creating from scratch. It could be content that you've already got. So like I mentioned, TikTok, YouTube, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of software allow you to do captioning. So if that's really all you need is making sure that your, your captions are done, any software will do that for you just about. Now, in addition, creating PDFs. PDFs are very challenging for people on the web, on, on websites. So you want to make sure that your PDFs are accessible. Essentially, PDFs with images and diagrams are usually not very accessible because it is unless you're unless you're using a very new version of Adobe that has the ability for you to add in that alt text on your images and add in captions and things like that on your images usually it essentially just skips right over the images and it doesn't help people read them at all and often Text-only PDFs are very difficult for an AI reader to understand. So in general, you want to avoid having PDFs on your website. Now, I'm thinking about some of your businesses here, and like Brendan has a business that is B2B, and a lot of the people who, you know, might be reading his, like Siobhan has a coaching and consulting business. Several of you have businesses where people might want to download a white paper or something like that on your website, right? Like you might have a white paper or you might have a case study or something like that that people would download. What you want to do in that case is think, first of all, is there a way for me to put this entire case study on my website, not in a PDF? And even if you're trying to use it as a lead magnet, is there a way for me to create a PDF version of this that is still very readable by the internet? And I actually have a resource for that too. Y'all know I'm always full of resources. One of my favorite for this is a software called Beacon. And Beacon is a really good solution if you have white papers or um, case studies and you want to use them as a lead magnet, like you want to have someone give you an email in order to download it. This software is great because what the, the PDF, I'm mean, using air quotes here, the PDF that it generates, it is downloadable. The person can print it off. It looks like a PDF, but it's technically a web page. Everything about it is a web page. It is automated. Like if you update it inside of the software, it'll update it for anyone who has access to that link. It's great. It's amazing. But it's it's just a web page. And you can also make it searchable and you can put your um your Google Analytics on it. It's really, really great. But it shows up like a PDF. So if you really want that pretty PDF look that is like a lead magnet, but you want to be able to get someone's email, see it like a beautiful PDF lead magnet, but you want to be able to get that email address to get the for someone to get that information, you want to use something like this so that it's creating something that looks like a PDF, but the reality is it's not. And this actually has the added benefit of actually like being able to integrate with your whatever um, email marketing software you have. So if you're using MailChimp or whatever, when someone does give you their email address, you can drop them straight onto a list inside of MailChimp. It's a very, very good software. So Beacon is a great one for getting that PDF look, but making it still accessible because that's what we're aiming at here is accessibility. Now, before we wrap up, I want to give you a few tips about like your emails and other types of things to make them very accessible. Make sure that whatever you're doing in your emails, that they are going in logical order. 
It is so difficult sometimes when an e-reader is reading an email, if the email has columns, meaning that there's like column A has text in it and then the column B has more text in it. It's very difficult to know which of those columns is supposed to be read first, all of that jazz. If you're going to do columns, make sure it is a column and an image instead of a column and another, a column of text and a column of text. Because two columns of text right next to each other are very difficult for someone who either has a reading comprehension or a visual disability to understand. And it's also very difficult for an e-reader to read. As someone who personally, I'm dyslexic, I have a hard time with reading words that are in a column next to each other because my brain doesn't want to differentiate between the two columns. I tend to blend the columns. So you want to, for people like me, again, I have a disability that is hidden. If you put two text of columns, right, two columns of text right next to each other, you end up with someone like me who I'm a very smart person, but I won't be able to read what you just wrote without taking a lot of effort. So don't do that. Like just don't use columns of text next to each other. If you're going to use a column, Column, make sure it's an image and a and text, not two big pieces of text. Emojis, sorry about that. Emojis are very difficult for people. So make sure that if you're using an emoji, I'm just going to say, I love, I love emojis in a subject line. I love them, but do not use them to convey information. So don't have your emoji for the word celebration or congratulations. Don't just have an emoji instead of saying the word congratulations. Say the word congratulations and then have your clinking glass, right? Because otherwise people won't know, like if they're using an assistive device, the assistive device might not know what you're trying to say. Nowadays, very fortunately, a lot of assistive devices will read the emoji. I don't know if you guys have like, my Bluetooth and my car will read text messages to you. And I love when people send you an emoji because it'll read the, the emoji like term. It'll say like weeping, smiley face. And it's hilarious. <laughs> but that is like, you know, only certain devices will read that. Others of them won't. So you want to make sure that you are using as much description as possible so that if someone is using an assistive device, it'll actually read it. Okay. Now, make sure that, again, best practices with emails, text more than everything. I know, I know, I know we, y'all, almost all of us here are old enough to be like <laughs> from the old days when it used to be images were the only way to make an email. Nowadays, you don't want to do that. If you make an email that's too image heavy, it might not even get delivered to their inbox in the first place. Um, remember that minimum font that I mentioned earlier. Make sure that minimum 14 is your game. Please do, please do, okay? Um, avoid visual cues based on color because people don't understand. So if you have something and you make it green and that's your version of like, go here, assume that people can't see that green. Assume that that is not what people are actually gonna see. And then make sure, of course, that you are closed captioning any video. Most video won't play in an email. So do whatever you can because most are not available. Um, so there's a uh, question in the chat about different types of um, accessibility tools. There are so many. I'm actually going to list a bunch of them at the end of this workshop. Some of them are free. There are some tools that are available via the ADA that are free. And then there are some that are quite expensive. Um, you just really want to determine for yourself which things are necessary and then whether they're apps like actually necessary for your business or if they're just nice to have. For the most part, a lot of what, you know, those extensive tools are going to do is things that either you could do yourself very easily or that you could set change a few settings in the backside of the back of your website to do for you, right? So some of those assistive technologies aren't really necessary anymore because a lot of our website providers like Wix and, you know, a lot of them have the ability for you to do that stuff yourself, okay? So if you have a physical space, make sure that you are ADA compliant, period. Um, and if you have a hard time with ADA compliance mentally, just borrow a stroller from somebody, honestly. Put a watermelon or two in it and roll it around. If you can't get around with a stroller easily in your shop, it's probably not accessible. Um, that's like one of my biggest like little pieces of advice for people is if you can't get around with a stroller, it's likely not accessible to put someone in a wheelchair, especially because strollers are significantly smaller than wheelchairs. Um, and welcome service animals. It's always useful to do, of course, based on the regulations in your city and all that, but it's always very nice. You want to think of these things as inclusive. 
This is one of my favorite things to think about with accessibility. We are not trying to be fancy or special or whatever. We're just trying to make sure that everyone who wants to give us money can. That is literally how I think of inclusivity as a business owner is, am I making it so that everyone who wants to give me money can? And if the answer to that is yes, then I feel like I'm doing my job. If the answer to that is no, then I got work to do, right? If there are still people who I'm not using, I'm not making, I'm not making myself available to them. I need to figure out how to do that. So as I mentioned, I have a whole set of links here. Um, this will be available to you. I will actually give this set of links to, um, to Anita so that she can give them to you all. It's a whole set of links just on disability support and accessibility guidelines, um, web uh, contrast checkers, all of these different ways for you to use different tool tools that are completely free for you to check on your own accessibility. Okay. Now, if I did not, I try to make sure I answer your questions as we're going along. So if you have any questions, I have a couple more minutes before the workshop is over. So go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I would be happy to answer your questions. If you have a second, we would also love for you to give us some feedback on this workshop. This is one of our newer workshops. Um, I've delivered it a few times. I love it. It's one of my favorites to talk about is website accessibility um, because there's so many different things that we can do to make our websites more accessible, to make our businesses more accessible. We just have to think about it. We have to think about it. And if you don't have any questions, then I will ask you my final final question that I ask all the time at the end of every workshop is now that you know all of this stuff, what are you going to do? So if you can in the chat, tell me, what are you planning on doing? How are you planning on using this information? What are your next steps? How are you going to go update your website? What are the things that you can do to make your website a little bit better, to make your business a little bit more accessible? What does that look like? So drop that information in the chat along with any questions that you might have. I am here for you. Okay. Well, I have to say, Lindsay, I've sat in on each one of these workshops and each one provides more information and more up-to-date information. So uh, it's fantastic that you're on top of things and able to really give good guidance to our clients. And I'm very grateful for that. Ah. I'm I'm glad to. I really I try to keep up to date myself. I'm constantly working with business owners to make sure that I'm getting as much information and updated as possible so that you guys can have whatever resources you need. So, I'm great. Right. I'm glad to so, see you guys are going to start working on your websites. As I said, um or as I put in the chat earlier, we will be sending out a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. And you can also find us on YouTube. But if you look at our website, we do post all of our webinars on the website once uh, once they've occurred. So the latest version here will go on our website within the next week. Awesome. So thank you so much, uh, Lindsay, for spending your time with us. and. Uh, helping our clients do a better job in occurring, uh, accruing customers. And uh, I have a lot of clients who are in the process of putting up their website and I always tell them to please go and view this webinar because I think it just provides so much good information. Yeah, I agree. It's great, especially I see several people in the chat who are getting started and I'm really looking forward to seeing what they come up with. Once you guys get your website, you got to come back in here and uh, and visit me again on another one of these and tell me what you got so I can review it. So, okay. Well, thanks again. And thank everybody uh, who came to the webinar tonight. I'm sure you'll find all of that information valuable. And uh, come back the next time she does it because there'll be more better updated information. So thank you and have a